Hello, everybody. This is Tali Berman, autism specialist and author, here alongside with... Hi, Roni Enten Visoker, individualized biomedical nutritionist. And we are part of the whole child team here, and we are doing our summer sessions, a video series where we are taking questions from parents and professionals all over the world and answering them, both from a biomedical and therapeutic perspective. Um, and as I mentioned in the first video, some questions I might answer if it feels like a more therapeutic type of question. Some questions Roni might answer if it feels more biomedical, and some questions we might answer together, um, tackling it at sort of both ends. Um, so we're going to answer, I think, three questions today, and uh, let's just get right into it. Ronnie, you want to introduce that first question? Yeah. So our first question today is from, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, is Danette. Danette, uh, what's that name? Yeah, uh, from California, and it's regarding her nine-year-old. She was asking what the cause of tippy-toeing is or toe-walking. This is an interesting question um, that I think has probably a number of causes, depending yeah. on the child. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm going to address it from my biomedical nutrition perspective, and I know Tali has um, a lot to add on that as well. Um, but from a biomed perspective, I have seen um, in my practice that a lot of kids that tippy-toe are dealing with some kind of underlying uh, gut issue, a gastrointestinal issue. Sometimes this can be yeast overgrowth, candida overgrowth, it can also be bacterial overgrowth um, that can induce that toe walking. Typically it's not nonstop all day, typically it comes in spurts, um, but I've seen that to resolve on occasion when we've treated uh, the underlying gut issue. So that's an interesting one. Hmm. Um, another can I, ask, sorry, can I ask about that? That's, it's interesting to me. As we were saying, we, we learn so much from each other as we do these right. things. We're like, I didn't realize that. Um, I don't know if this is something that you know, but is it is it more understood what that relationship is? Meaning why? That's a great over, question. It's kind of like these random seeming yes. cause and symptom. Is there an understanding about that relationship? Well, first of all, I want to say that Treating the gut is always the number one thing that we do because it's related to so many different kinds of symptoms and different symptoms in every child. Um, I don't know that there's conclusive information about the connection, mm -hmm. um, but I can uh, hypothesize that a lot of times when we're dealing with these gut bugs or overgrowth, there's also toxins that are, are secreted at the same time. Um, it can cause issues um, from a sensory perspective. I think that sometimes treating it properly can kind of reduce the sensory overload, help a child to feel physically better, and not cause them to uh, do some of the some of the stimming, which you know one one type of which can be toe walking. Again, in another child, it could be a very different source, but from my perspective, that is one thing that I've seen to be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I start to say that along the same lines, if a child is dealing with a food sensitivity or a food allergy, that can also cause undesirable behaviors like that uh, or sensory overload. So I would definitely explore uh, the possibility of there being a food sensitivity, a food allergy, and checking out the gut, making sure there's no leaky gut, working with a practitioner who can help assess that and treat. Great. Excellent. Because um, I know this is sort of one of those mystery things for many people, like, why is my kid toe right. A lot of parents have questions about that. Um, and what I just wanted to add, which is something very linked to what you've already started to talk about, was the sensory piece. You know, that for many kids, this is a sensory integration issue um, and has a lot to do with their um, imbalances in feeling their body, feeling their body in space, spatial awareness, um, and their relationship to other things around them. And so that's where a sensory integration program can be really helpful. And not just any sensory integration program, I just wanted to share, there's a program that, and you and I have talked about this, um, mm -hmm. that I'm doing right now. And I've done several different movement programs. Um, and this one I found to be really effective. I'm using it right now with my own son, who struggles with some learning challenges. Um, and um, it does, it's particular movements that, that are incredibly effective for children who have sensory integration issues. Um, and Sonia Story, the one who's created this program called Move, Play, Thrive, so you can go to her website, moveplaythrive.com, um, really talks about uh, toe walking and how that is a symptom that has really decreased with a lot of kids when this uh, program has been put in place and has been implemented and more sensory integration is taking place. So, and she also talks about, I was just talking to Sonia the other day, how she really talks about um, the importance of having 
a healthy, nutritious um, diet and having the biomedical piece really under control at the same time while working on the sensory integration. And as I said, I've done a couple of different programs and this one I find to be really relationship-based, really positive, have, has a flexibility that I think ma many parents need and some really simple movements that your kids could really enjoy. I know my own son, at one point I did one movement with him. He's like, this feels so good. Why does this oh, feel so good? You know, like he couldn't great. understand it. But, but it was, it was um, really calming to his system, really calming to his brain and really organizing him in ways that he needed to be organized. So I think the biomedical piece, along with some really um, useful sensory integration programs that really address that issue is, is really key. Um, anything else you want to say to that, Ronnie, before I move on? Um, I, I think that we've covered everything between the two of us that I wanted to okay. mention, Kelly. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, so this next question is from Denise, who um, submitted a question from Illinois about her son, who is 25. Um, and her question is about personal hygiene. How can you encourage your young adult to maintain personal hygiene, showering every other day, regular haircuts, teeth brushing, use of deodorant, et cetera? Um, okay, and which, in the question of, is there anything you think we need to know to help us best answer your question, um, she, she did add that he used to shower, maybe that was soap, every day in high school, but now he says he doesn't like the way his skin feels. Um, and his own scent doesn't bother him, so he doesn't really have that incentive to wear deodorant or shower and things like that. Okay, and I wanted to mention that because that's an important piece to one of the responses I'm going to start with. So first of all, I would say, there's a couple steps here. The first thing I'm going to say is to really explain and speak directly to your child, adolescent, about the issue of self-hygiene, um, especially, and if possible, in a way that will be motivating and meaningful for your child. So for example, if your adolescent really wants to be in a relationship or really wants to be independent and have a job or really wants to be going to school or wants to make friends, whatever, if you can find what might be motivating for your specific child and help them understand the importance of how you look and how you smell and how you present yourself and how that will impact his ability to get a job or be in a relationship, that's going to make the, most, the biggest impact. The way, any way that you can make it meaningful for your child is changes the game entirely because then if he wants it for himself you have a partner in the process versus trying to get him to do something that you want for him just a much more challenging approach mm -hmm. so the first thing is to really talk about it um it also might be in, in terms of health health related you know if you don't brush your teeth what that might lead to um you know if you don't take care of yourself properly clean yourself properly what that might lead to so the first piece is to really talk about it in a very direct in-depth and comprehensive way the importance of hygiene um, that's the first step. The next one is not trying to hit everything at once, but pick one. Pick one area within hygiene that you want to really pursue and help your child master and make consistent. So instead of trying to get him to brush his teeth every day and shower every day and put on deodorant, you know, that you want to help your child and set him up to be successful at whatever it is he's doing. So pick the one thing that is a priority or the one thing that you feel like is the lowest hanging fruit, you know, the thing that might be, he's already kind of have skills in place for, wouldn't be the biggest step forward to help him be consistent with that. Because once he experiences um, confidence and success around that, he'll be much more willing to then take on the next step. So it's important to build it and, and what I call stepping stone skills over time and really create a strong foundation with one first before you then add on the next piece. So pick the one, um, Denise, that feels uh, most important to you that you want to really want to focus on first. Um, sorry, I was going down here. And then the, 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 the third piece is identifying the sensory issue and modify and adapt as best you can. So one of the things Denise mentioned was that he said he doesn't like the way his skin feels. Now, this is a really important piece of information and you should, you know, it's a wonderful thing that you have that information not every kid is able to express it in that way, that something from a sensory perspective isn't working for him or for her. And so instead of trying to get him to do it the way we do it, we want to try to really adapt ourselves and adapt to whatever hygiene you're working on so that it is, works for your child. So for example, um, you know, with the shower, it might be he doesn't like the way that the shower head beats on his skin. 
So you might adapt the shower head so that it has the more gentle stream or has a different stream, you know, give the different choices, see what he might pick. Or you might do a bath instead of a shower, right? Or you might do a sponge bath where he sits and he sort of soaks himself up with a washcloth and then pours water over him. You know, it doesn't have to look the way you've always imagined it. If there's some stretch or challenge in there that if you were to modify, can really take care of that challenge. I know, for example, Ronnie and I both work with someone and he has a challenging time in the shower. He can't stand in the shower because the echo of the shower, um, this is our, our family in Norway, is creates a sort of dizzying experience for him. So I talked to the mom about, well, why don't we put a bench in the shower and let him sit down? You know, like I remember my grandmother having one of those benches in the shower and she would sit down and, you know, cause she couldn't do it while she was standing and allow him to shower and clean himself up while sitting. Right. So I think it's really important to really think about what is a sensory issue and how can I modify this activity to be as supportive um, as possible to make it easier for him. And then I have another one. Hold on a second. The last one is, oh, the last one is, and this is especially important if you have a hard time finding that meaningful motivation for your child, like he doesn't really is interested in a relationship, isn't interested in getting a job, isn't interested in any of the things that might really motivate someone to practice consistent hygiene, um, is to create a real incentive around it. You know, like, okay, so we're going to do five days. We're going to like shower every day or every other day, or, you know, for the next two weeks, we're going to do it every other day, mark it on the calendar. And when we get to 10, we're going to like get dressed up and go out for a fancy dinner, you know, or go golfing or whatever it is that might be motivating for him, finding an exterior motivation that might be an incentive for your child or adolescent. If the activity itself isn't inherently motivating, um, and make it into something fun, something that they can work towards, something that they can gain a reward from and feel really proud of themselves for, and then move on to the next uh, skill. It would also work towards some sort of incentive and exciting activity. Uh, so I'm going to do a real quick recap. <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's talking directly to your child about hygiene and the importance of hygiene. Um, doing stepping stone skills, picking one and really focusing on that one before you build on after that. Um, identifying the sensory issue and creating any kind of modification or adaptation that you can, which will take a little creativity, but uh, you can do it. And the last one is some creating some kind of uh, exciting incentive to help them feel really motivated to accomplish the goal you have set up for them. That's what I got. <laughs> Anything you want to add to that, Moni, or is that more primarily? I don't think I can add to that. That was very comprehensive. <laughs> very comprehensive. <laughs> That's and again, great. true for any kid, you know, like a, any parent who's got any neurotypical kid who's just like resisting brushing their teeth or resisting taking a shower, same thing goes. I think those series of steps can really be helpful for any, any kid. Not only that, Tali, I was thinking even about the elderly population that sometimes has difficulty with some of those areas. I think that's very relevant to them as well. Mm -hmm. um, dementia patients in particular. So very interesting. Yeah. Um, all right, so you want to take the next question? Okay, so our next question is from Anne Marie in New Brunswick, Canada. And she asked about pacing and meltdowns. Um, Tali, do you have the, her exact wording handy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, I was just reading it. She writes, mm -hmm. How do I go about stopping my son from pacing in the classroom? But interesting, as soon as he starts pacing, the teacher wants him out and removes him immediately. And that's what results in the meltdown. The meltdown is that he's being removed from the classroom mm -hmm. um, because of his pacing. Um, it's not like the teacher gets very easily distracted by his pacing. Um, yeah, I think that that's the relevant information there. Yeah, so, you know, again, from a biomedical perspective, I would ask what's causing the pacing? What's causing him to not be able to sit down in his chair in class comfortably? Um, and I'm wondering if this is something that happens outside of class as well, or if it's just in the classroom. Because if it's happening all the time and there's really some um, you know, problems with hyperactivity, ADHD type symptoms, then there's a lot that biomed can do for that. Again, it has to do with addressing the root causes, the underlying issues. I always go back to the gut. You know, is there anything systemically that's bothering him? Um, does he have any dysbiosis, any bacterial or yeast problems? Um, and if so, I would work on treating that and balancing that. 
In addition, are there food issues, food sensitivities, or allergies that are causing this? Definitely can be a root cause and something to explore. Um, and then finally, you know, there are basic things like supplements that can help to take the edge off and calm him down. So again, I don't know if there's a supplement protocol in place, but a lot of times simple minerals like magnesium, calcium, trace minerals can be helpful. Um, so there are calming amino acids. So it's, again, very individualized. Mm -hmm. I would seek out to see if there's any underlying causes for this, if it is something that's happening all the time, and then go from there. Great. I mean, that's, that's so critical. It's almost impossible for a child to sit still when all that's going on for them. It's not even really fair to ask of them, you know, when those kind of biomedical issues um, are going on. I think that's such an important point. Um, I have a couple of things to add. And first, I would really love to ask the teacher to be a little bit more compassionate <laughs> about what's yes, going yeah. on for this kid. Um, and really, you know, really try to talk to the teacher and explain, uh, for example, if you're going to go the biomedical route, that we're trying to get to the root um, causes of his pacing and his need to move um, and take some time, you know, ways to just be understanding while that's being worked out. Um, the other thing I want to add is going back to the sensory integration um, program that I was talking about, Move, Play, Thrive, uh, which is a program created by Sonia Story. So she does a lot of the movements that really address things like attention, um, the ability to sit still, which is really very hard for kids when they don't have proper reflex integration. She has very specific movements that help to integrate specific reflexes that address attention, focus, and learning. So that's another thing that I would really uh, focus on. Again, that's the underlying cause of what those issues are. And the last piece is when you understand that his behavior, which is pacing, comes from a deeper need, right? We want to help him to be able to fulfill that need, but in a way that works a little bit better for him and for his environment. Clearly, he wants to be in the classroom. He has a meltdown when he's kicked out, which is an amazing thing. He wants to be there. So the question is, how can we help him be there? given that he has needs that hopefully through sensory integration work, um, through biomedical interventions can ultimately be addressed so that he doesn't have to pace. But as we know, there's a process to that. Um, so are there ways that we can help him have movement in a way that maybe is less distracting for the teacher and won't result in her kicking him out of class? Um, so for example, I know there's like these balance um, uh, seats that a child can sit on that can allow them to kind of move around a little bit while they're sitting. Um, there might be toys that he can play with um, and squeeze and push and have another outlet, basically. He has like this unsettled energy. Is there another outlet he can do that would be less distracting that he can do either while he's sitting on his desk um, or even going to the back of the classroom um, and having something that he can stand on, having something that he can balance on um, that would help him have that outlet and not be distracted or, you know, leaving the classroom, taking a break getting out that energy, coming back, um, and seeing if that will help him to be more restful and more focused in the classroom. But I think the question is not necessarily how to help him um, to not do the pacing, although we want to help under address the underlying cause, but then how can we help him um, have a coping mechanism that will be more socially appropriate for him and work a little bit better for the teacher so that he doesn't get the kind of negative attention he can stay in the classroom. And that might take some experimenting, you know, trying with different tools, trying different strategies um, that will allow him to really do that. And that was our last question for today, right? I think so. Okay, so that was video number two of our summer session series. Um, and again, we just want to let everybody know that as you're listening, if you feel like this combined approach of both the biomedical piece like, you know, Morning was talking about the interventions, you know, checking for bacteria. Those are things that we do with families through lab work, really seeing and identifying what the issues are, addressing them, creating a therapeutic plan to um, help your child once he's in a position to be more uh, able to learn, to really gain the skills, um, social skills, academic skills, lots of other skills to have them in place. So we are offering a $250 discount for anyone who is interested and um, working with us together in the whole child package until August 1st. And again, we'll put the link for our whole child website, um, which is wholechildcoaching.co. And the process basically is, is you can um, click the button to, sh to submit your short application. It's four or five quick questions. Once we get the application from you, set up a time to talk 
and learn more about your child and see if it's a good match. And if so, talk about the next steps making that happen. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, you can go to our website and learn more and start the process by submitting your application. And we would love to work with you. Yes, we would. Um, anything else you want to add, Ronnie, before we wrap up? I think that's it. Okay, cool. But thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for your questions, for submitting them, everyone. Yep, thank you for your questions. Thank you for submitting them. And I will also put the link to submit questions if you haven't yet done that and you'd like to. And we'd love to uh, support you in the best way that we can. All right, take care. Have a good day. Great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.